Hello everyone and welcome to your library at home on this Saturday afternoon. My name's Sam Hagen and I manage the public programs at the State Library of New South Wales. I'd like to begin today as we always do by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are all standing. For me that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and of course emerging. This afternoon, I'm very ha happy to be introducing Maggie Patton, the Library's Manager of Research and Discovery and our resident map and rare book expert. Maggie has been spending some of her lockdown working on an exhibition planned for 2021, all about mapping the Pacific. But today, Maggie is presenting some of her favourite atlases, including Van Kulen's atlas called, in English, the new and great shining torch of the sea with a, such a grand title. I can't wait to see it myself. So let's jump in. Maggie, are you with us? I'm with you, Sam, and I'm now going to start this rocky road of webinars. Okay. Oh, oh. Great. There you are. Now I can see you in the okay. reading room. Look at that. Yes. So while you're setting up, Maggie, I'll just let everyone know we will have a bit of time uh, for some Q&A at the end. There's a little Q&A button down the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question through, the, through Maggie's presentation, type it in. I'll be monitoring that as we go. So I'll see you again uh, at the end of, of Maggie's chat and have a nice time. Over to you, Maggie. Thank you. And as Sam says, I'm in the Mitchell Reading Room at the moment. Um, you can see that behind me with any luck. And yes, this is my first webinar. So this could be a very rocky journey together. So thank you for coming along today as I discuss the world in a book. An atlas is essentially a collection of maps with the same dimensions and design engraved specifically for publication with a related text. Of course, books of maps would have been published and printed earlier. In the 15th and 16th centuries, manuscript charts Printed maps were sometimes bound together in a single volume, but really according to a client's need. A ship's pilot might have gathered together some manuscript charts of the Mediterranean, had them bound. A merchant might have asked for some maps of his particular area of interest to be bound together, but they were a unique one-off thing. In the 1560s, the Lafrere Atlas is an example, essentially an Italian atlas assembled to order, but the maps were often varied in design and size. Gerard Mercator coined the word atlas for a book of maps, although he did not publish the first atlas. It was probably his original idea, however, to put together maps of a similar format and shape. The term atlas does not refer to the Titan contempt, condemned to hold up the heavens for eternity, but to a Greek hero atlas, a bearded man skilled in philosophy, mathematics and astronomy. Credited with inventing the celestial sphere and often pictured measuring the globe with a compass. Mercator, of course, was also famous in um, 1569 for printing the first map on the Mercator projection. So this is Abraham Ortelius, the first publisher of an atlas, Teatrum Orbis Terrarum, or Theatre of the World. Originally from Augsburg, Ortelius moved to Antwerp in 1560 at the age of 19. He was registered to the Guild of St. Luke as a colorist of maps and prints. Later on in life, when he was a very famous and successful publisher, many of his clients still asked that he color their maps personally. This of course was the realm of his sister, Anne. Ortelius traveled extensively in Europe, England and Ireland. He spoke a number of languages, Flemish, Latin, Greek, German, Italian, French, he was a very educated uh, publisher. Many of the map makers, of course, didn't travel. They just took the information from fellow travelers. So the first Atlas Teatrum Orbis Terrarum was published in 1570 and continued to be published in several editions until 1612. The first Latin edition consisted of 70 maps and 53 sheets. Teatrum was an immediate success. The Atlas cost around seven florins and a coloured version was 16 florins. I read an article suggesting that a clerk in that particular period might have earned 14 to 50 florins a year. So it would have been a very expensive purchase. There are around 100 copies printed of the first edition. 
The Teatrum was not meant as an aid for travel. There aren't any roads marked. Uh, there aren't any, um, it's too big to carry. It was essentially for armchair travellers. And in fact, Ortelius says that to the reader in his introduction. The Atlas opens with this famous title page in the form of a porch through which the reader enters the theatre of the whole world. From the 16th century, these sorts of um, very decorative title pages or frontispieces, frontispieces was typical at the beginning of their works. They often used allegorical images and symbols reflecting the contents of the book and appealing to the potential readers. Now seated at the top, I'm gonna to zoom in here, and this is going to work, I'm sure. Seated at the very top of this title page, we have a woman representing Europe. She wears the imperial crown, um, she has a scepter in her right hand and holds a rudder in the form of a cross. Europe is ruling the world, inspired by God and blessed with riches, certainly the opinion of the day. Asia is on the left down here, dressed in a jeweled gown. Uh, on the right, we have Africa over across here. And on the back here, down the bottom here, we have um, America naked America with a cudgel in her hand and the head of a man across here. And over to the right, we have what looks like an incomplete figure, in fact, representing the land of Magellan Magellanica or the Tierra del Fuego. So at the bottom, as Magellan sails through the Magellan Straits, he reports of the land of fire to the south as he's sailing through to the Pacific in 1520. This is a very famous world map, which is in the, this particular atlas. Tipus Orbis Terrarum is now iconic. and includes a distinctive, if you can have a look across here, I might just zoom in again. It almost has a distinct passage across the top of America and into the Pacific. Down the bottom, it has a very um, large mass, southern land mass across here. And at the bottom, there is a quote here, which says by Cicero, who can consider human affairs to be great when he comprehends the eternity and vastness of the entire world? But let's just have a little bit of a look here in this map. So we're talking 1570, we have South America here, but it's a little bit of a different shape to what we expect today. North America stretches right across the top here, across over here beneath Asia, not much evidence here of Australia, but quite a detailed East Indies around over here. So that's our Tipus Orbis Terrarum. Another very famous map from this particular atlas, India Orientalis, Southeast Asia. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit here too. So across the top, oh, gone too far, haven't I? <laughs> At the top here, we have the um, Portuguese coat of arms, because of course, we're talking 1570s, the Port Portugal still has control over the trade in the East Indies here. Uh, Java's looking a little bit large here. Uh, New Guinea, very large over here. And we have Japan here, not quite the shape that we expect today. And across here, we have some sea monsters, two uh, mermaids looking into their looking glasses together and a double spouted whale here, it looks like he's atta um, attacking this ship. So quite often in the maps that you see today, you'll see monsters like this. So what was their purpose? Perhaps to uh, scare off, to say that this is a great unknown ocean or sea, beware of the dangers lurking there, but also perhaps for decoration, because there's some awful large spaces in these maps where the unknown lands are. And perhaps a map maker is adding details and interest for the person who's commissioned or purchasing the map. I love this one here, mainly for these fantastic fighting ships down the bottom here, great detail. But look across over here at the bottom of Africa. Look how close South America is. It's as though they haven't quite gauged the distance around the world's surface. So let's move on a little bit here. This is the cover of this particular atlas. And you can see that it's bound in kangaroo skin. Beautiful blind tooling. This was done by the Mitchell Bindery in the early 20th century. 
And this is the typical uh, text page that would sit opposite the, the maps or behind the maps. Our next atlas here is Atlas Siva Cosmographica from 1630, published by Johodes Jodokus Hondius and his son Hendrik, based on Mercator's first atlas of 1585-95. Hondius was an emigre in England until 1595 when he returned to the Netherlands. He'd worked as an engraver in England, but when he sets up his shop, he becomes a publisher. He acquired the plates and rights to publish Mercator's atlas from the heirs of Mercator's estate. Fresh maps were engraved and added to the atlas and a new edition was published in 1606. It was very successful again, published in Latin and in French, many editions up to 1630. So let's have a look at the title page again with this architectural, whoops, too far, <laughs> with this large architectural feature uh, with, um, with um, Atlas in the center around the outside. We have uh, Europe, the cornucopia of flowers and fruit. Uh, we have Asia across over here. Up the top here, we have um, uh, America with a crossbow, uh, with an armadillo, it seems. And over here, we have Africa sitting on a crocodile. And you'll see this fantastic Mitchell stamps here. We do like to do a good stamp. If the map ever goes missing, if this book goes missing, we certainly know who owns it. And across here, we have another image from the Atlas, which shows uh, Mercator and Hondius sitting together, uh, looking at a couple of spheres, uh, a chart at the back. I think this is gonna make a great Zoom background for the future. And this is one of my favorite maps from this particular Atlas. It's the first map of the Strait of Magellan um, to appear in a commercial Atlas. You can see uh, the detail, it's a chart, so you can actually see it has fathoms, it actually has some guide on where you should be navigating, a number of names across the, the strait itself. You can see here this beautiful cartouche. Now a cartouche is a frame which a map maker uses to enclose text, um, perhaps the name of the map, the map maker itself. Perhaps over here you can see that the um, cartouche includes the scale. And over here we have some profiles of the entrance of the Straits of Magellan. These cartouches become incredibly decorated in the 17th century and you'll see a few later on. But look at this beautiful colored compass rose here and the fleur de lis here pointing north. Aha, that tells us something. We're actually looking at this map upside down. So here's Tierra del Fuego here. Here's the tip of South America. Looks as though Tierra del Fuego is heading off into the ocean here. So this is um, almost 50 years before um, Le Maire and Schouten actually travel below South America, proving that Tierra del Fuego is an island. Acclaimed as the largest and most splendid atlas published in the 17th century, this is the Atlas Major a Geographia Blaviana published by Blau in 1662 to around 1667. The multi-volumed atlas presented the state of geographic knowledge in the world in the mid 17th century and apologies to the Camille Sagi bookshop because I have actually taken this image from their website, but they have a copy of this atlas for sale if you'd like to buy one, if you've got enough money. It was the most expensive book that could be acquired, a collector's item for powerful and wealthy clients and an influential gift for potential sponsors. The atlas was published in a number of languages, Dutch, English, German, French, and Spanish, and varied between nine and 12 volumes. The maps include cover every, every different country, and they're sourced possibly from manuscripts, but more likely from maps that Blau would have printed himself earlier or the maps of other map makers, sometimes updated with new information or perhaps not. The purchases of these atlases were primarily interested in display, luxury bindings, fine engravings, bright color, beautiful topography. That was emphasized over the currency of the contents and the maps themselves. There are a lot of maps of British Isles and China in this particular set of, of volumes. Perhaps Blau had a lot of new and current information about those countries. There are around 1,500 double pages in these atlases and around 3,000 pages of text. It cost around 350 guilders for a plain black and white copy 
and 450 for a coloured copy. Now at the time that would have been perhaps the annual rent for a shop, uh, the annual salary of a skilled craftsman. The Blau firm had a lar the largest printing shop in Europe in Amsterdam uh, that included over 80 um, full-time workers uh, with over 15 printing presses running simultaneously full-time. In 1667, they added a second print shop. Unfortunately, a fire broke out in 1672, destroying one of the print shops. Blau dies in 1673 and many of the copper plates from his maps are picked up and reused and republished by other map makers afterwards. This is a very, very splendid frontispiece from the first volume, which in, in, in the flesh is incredibly bright and um, highlighted in gold. If we have a look a little bit closer, you can see up the top here, the title of the atlas, up here held by a group of puti or cherubs. At the center here, we have Sybil, the earth goddess with her crown holding a key. She's surrounded by four female figures and she's on a chariot led by a couple of lions. So the people that are hanging around her, we have uh, Europe here with her horse. We have um, America with an armadillo over here. Asia stands over here with a camel and Africa leading an elephant, a very grand and beautiful image, which is based in fact on a painting by Rubens, which is in the Louvre, which however isn't of Sybil, but of Queen Marie de Medici and her husband, Henri IV, entering Lyon in 1600. This is a very beautiful world map. It's at the beginning of volume one. It's in a double hemisphere design, which gives you a much better shape of the world. And it also gives the map maker plenty of some decorative features. You can see at the center is Apollo, the sun god, um, and to his right is Venus, and Mercury. And up the center is uh, the moon as a cherub crawling up inside these two hemispheres. Along the bottom, we have the four seasons, a very typical scene in many of these world maps. Spring, summer, autumn, and the old man of winter. And if we had a look at this map here, you can see this is post Tasman. So we can see we have an outline here of um, the west coast of Australia, we can see where he, um, where he maps the bottom of Van Diemen's Land, Tasmania. He sails um, up to New Zealand. Um, and you can see we're starting to remove that large Southern Ocean down the bottom. This next map here is a map very typical of uh, some of the earliest maps that Blau's father produced with these vignettes around the outside. So here we have uh, Europe, and around the edges are the various um, nations in Europe. Along the top, small vignettes of the cities, of course, starting with Amsterdam, the center of map making at this period. Now let's have a little bit of a look. Oh, look, there's some nice bears up at the Arctic Circle here. But let's have a look at this map, the incredible detail, the cities, the rivers. Let's remember this is engraved in the reverse on the copper sheet for printing, incredibly um, skilled technicians. This is the title page of the Asia volume. Uh, you can see again that architectural feature and here again we have a chart, we have a sphere and these cherubs gambling around the bottom of the page. Uh, this map of um, the province of uh, Peking, a very famous cartouche here. you can see getting very decorative here with the uh, Chinese imperial family and two beautiful birds here, uh, possibly birds of paradise. And if you can look a little bit, you can see the major cities are all in red on the map. Uh, here is another one showing uh, the vignettes around the outside. Now this particular one, uh, Blau is depicting five Dutch ships in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean certainly laying claim to the power of the Dutch East India Company in this period at the moment. They've ousted Portugal around 1600 and now the Dutch uh, are the main imperial power in this area at the time. Down the bottom here, we have the Greek god Titan 
featured. He's shown as a merman blowing his conch shell. Known as the messenger of the sea in Greek mythology, he would blow his conch shell to either raise or calm the waves, creating a sound so alarming that all the surrounding giants and sea creatures would flee in terror. Perhaps Blau is suggesting that this Greek god is warning enemy ships away from the areas that's ruled by the Dutch. And here finally, the new and great shining torch of the sea. Um, a beautiful Dutch atlas produced by the Van Coolen family. They operated a chart making publishing firm in Amsterdam for nearly 200 years. It was founded by Johannes Van Coolen, who registered his business as bookseller and cross staff maker. Following the death of Johan, his widow and two sons ran the company for a number of years. We have a certain fondness for the Van Coolen family as they kept the manuscript chart of the Tasman map, which we have in our collection in the archives for many years, safely until the mid 19th century when it was purchased by a private um, collector. The new shining sea torch was begun in 1681, initially five volumes and then extend, expanded to six in the early 18th century, which then included the Pacific region. Uh, let's have a look at this once again splendid title page, which is also highlighted in gold. We have um, Neptune, who's standing behind a large sphere, holding his trident and um, dividers in his other hand, being crowned here. We have him surrounded by, again, Europe. This time she has a beautiful map, which I think is the English Channel, um, with her bull as a companion animal. Across the way, we have Asia accompanied by a lion and lioness, a parrot over here with Asia, oh no, with Africa. And in the skies, I particularly like, we have um, Aeoli, the god of wind, sitting astride a bladder or a sack as he travels across the sky. Here is uh, the frontispiece for part one, and we have a very tall, graceful female here holding a flaming torch, because that, of course, is the title of the atlas, uh, with some very stormy clouds at that ground. And in the front, we see she's illuminating the sea and the creatures within the sea, including Mercury with his winged helmet. And across over here, we have a map of the world. Now, this is very typical of a chart rather than a map because there isn't a lot of detail in the land, but more the detail is in the sea. You can see we have the compass points, we have the rum lines, which we use by the navigator to plot a course. Um, very typical, it has quite a beautiful cartouche up the top. But also we have this feature here. We have this one here, which looks like California as an island. And the mapping of California as an island is a mistake that was copied and republished by map makers over a period of around 100 years. One theory suggests that Spanish clergyman Antonio de la Ascension encouraged the error in the 1620s to counter Francis Drake's claim for Nova Albion or North America. If um, Drake landed on an island and claimed it, then he would not have a claim for North America itself. Come across here, you can see we've got once again uh, the Tasman route, Tasman lands that were chartered and the Dutch East Indies across here. And finally, this chart here, which is of the Indian Ocean from the coast of Africa across to Australia. Again, a chart which shows you the sea, the rum lines, the beautiful um, compass roses. Quite a beautiful cartouche here. But also, whoops, let's go back there because I want to show you the cartouche up the top, which is a very gruesome and famous one. So you can see the overseer here and down here, we have someone whose head is decapitated and the head is lying on the ground here. So these cartouche were really used to add information, uh, not necessarily about the map, but about the regions that they were being um, portrayed, the people that lived there, the activity, the activity of the people and the powers that worked there and traded. These maps are all from an atlas that was acquired as part of the Mitchell collection. And um, let's just jump up here. 
I think we're almost at the end of my selection of maps today. I um, might leave some time for questions, but I'd just like to flip over here. Each of these atlases that I've been discussing today are part of um, moving towards, they were planned to be in an exhibition opening in July this year, but it's now opening in, in July next year. But our conservators are already working on the material to be shown in that exhibition. And this is our fantastic, one of our fantastic bookbinders, Steve Bell. And he has actually taken the entire text block out of this atlas. Uh, you can see the vellum binding at the bottom here. He's repairing the text block and that will be placed back in the covers, ready to display in the exhibition. And I thought I might just uh, finish with a final treat. One of the most evocative things about working with these atlases is that the paper is made from rag, very high quality, very thick and rich. And the sound they make when you turn the pages is fantastic. So I thought I might finish here with a little bit of virtual page turning for you. Uh, the book is The Speculum Orbis Terrae by Gerard de Hode, uh, published in Antwerp in 1593. Thanks for coming along to the Mitchell Library today and listening to this talk, but here we go. There you go. Thank you. That's your virtual experience. I might pause that. Hi, Maggie. Oh. I'm back. That's so beautiful. Okay. How did you do that? That's beautiful. Oh, don't tell me. <laughs> I've got other questions from other people. <laughs> okay, it's going to keep page turning. I'm not quite sure how to stop yeah. it. That's all right. We if can I just back one. And watch i do people have got a few questions so if you don't mind i might just jump in while okay page turning. If i disappear it's because the battery's finishing up on oh. <laughs> well i think we've lost maggie um so what i'm going to do here we go is i've only got i've got about eight or nine questions what i might do is get these to maggie and try and get her to answer you on Zoom. Um, but considering we've lost our speaker, I think I can say that's all for today. Thank you so much for joining us and we really look forward to seeing you again at uh, your library at home very soon. Have a great afternoon. Bye.